Alrighty, we are starting today's Q&A from YouTube. And the first question was, when does the next season start? So for the first time, we actually have like a, a granule of information about this. Um, we don't know for sure, obviously, because of these strikes, but it does look like at least one of the two strikes is narrating its conclusion. There's hope that the writers strike. Um, they might have reached a tentative agreement. They, both sides have to still vote on it and prove it, but um, we're close in that regard. Uh, even if these strikes end, though, like soon, within the next week or so, you know, I, it's going to be late winter, spring, I think, before we get new episodes of Yellowstone or 1923. Regarding the profanity, Rip and the Cowboys, specifically Lloyd, uh, are hard men. In fact, they're virtually outlaws. Outlaws don't ever say darn. They use the words like the F word, damn, like you and I use the word V. Uh, Taylor Sheridan doesn't use them gratuitously. It is realistic. This was a response to our conversation last week where we both said we were a little bit thought it was a little too much swearing sometimes on Yellowstone. And and this person is right. This came from YouTube. And and yes, there probably is a lot of cursing in the cowboy land, but it, I don't, you know, we're watching a fictional show, like we're suspending some sort of reality. I think we can suspend reality here on the curse words as well, just for the sake of, um, yeah, normal people don't use that kind of language regularly. Right. Well, and to, I, cause I mean, to their point, like I understand that they're outlaws and all the above, but like you said, it's, you said this last episode or last podcast, like, yes, it's one thing being in the, the day-to-day real life world, but when you're using it a ton on a show, it just doesn't, like you said, it doesn't always pack as much punch as like, if you used it less often, it would just maybe hold a little bit more gravity. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay, last two I have, or sorry, no, last one I have is from Facebook, and it's regarding Kevin Costner leaving. Lisa says they need to call Tom Selleck and replace him. Uh, I don't want one person causing the end of the show. So I love Tom Selleck, but if you've watched Tom Selleck on Blue Bloods like I have, you are, you can see he is not physically able to, like perform on Yellowstone like when 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 Frank Reagan stands up on Blue Bloods it's an event because <laughs> that man is has some mobility issues like he's oh, always no. sitting down he can barely walk he is not getting up on a horse he <laughs> so is Tom, I haven't seen him in a hot minute he is a tall he is he is fine the last time I've seen I saw him <laughs> was on uh killers with uh Oh my gosh, what, uh, Ashton Kutcher and Katherine Heigl, I think. I didn't see That's, that movie. It's it's kind of a rom-com, I guess. There's Anyways. a weird thing about women of young women of a certain age having a crush on Tom Selleck that I am afraid to explore because you are not alone. Like there is <gasps> like 20, 30, 40 year old women like crush hard on Tom Selleck, who's damn near 80. Billy, I'm not saying I'm wanting to date Tom Selleck. Like, do not put those words in my <laughs> mouth. I'm are. saying he look he is attractive just like i would say actually hot take i actually don't think george george clooney is kind of attractive but once again i'm not saying i want to date the man kind of are <laughs> well on that note staff at tasteofcountry.com is where you can leave your <laughs> tra- tell me if you also think tom Selleck's attractive no i mean you can if you want to use that as your, your email response but that's where you can leave your trivia answer and also if you have any comments on episode two and three and your thoughts feel free to leave them there or on our youtube video in the comments and also i said this in the beginning but feel free to rate Rate us on Spotify and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on either. Share it with a friend, someone who might enjoy this. listening to this. One quick correction while you dream up the perfect adjective to describe our show in the Town okay. Square Media Network. Um, last week, I think I insinuated that Tom, uh, that uh, Kevin Costner was begging to return. I, I misrepresented that. His begging to return came several months ago before all negotiations sort of broke off. It was not a result of his new divorce and everything. So uh, dashing a little bit of hope there that Kevin Costner may come back for season six or seven, although it does seem to still make a lot of sense because everybody wants it. Um, I was wrong on that one. Well, that is.
that didn't. I, I'll sleep at night because I had already put that to bed in, in my emotional, I know. my emotional bucket. I understand. Well, as always, the Dutton Rules Podcast is another invigorating media podcast. Invigorating. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> yeah, I got a big arsenal of words over your belly just using them one week at a time. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Beth Dutton was absolutely provoking. Yeah. I literally was like, girl, you want him to fight you. You want him to physically react. When she said, I literally wrote the quote, a man would have walked away. I'm like, if I entered that with my brothers, I know I am absolutely asking. I want them to rebuttal. You're not trying to lull, you know, and mull things over. You are wanting a reaction. You're listening to the Dutton Rules Yellowstone podcast. And I'm pumped today because we are recapping both episodes two and three of season one. So you're getting... Uh, a Costco version of the episodes. <laughs> and I'm also excited because we now do a video format of this podcast. So if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, thank you so much. And as always, we greatly appreciate uh, ratings, reviews, and even if you want to send this to a friend, I will not stop you. I will be very, very thankful for that. And if you like seeing our faces and who is behind these wonderful voices, head on over to YouTube where you can find not only the video portion of the podcast, but you can also find we do weekly episode recaps where you'll get nice little B-roll footage of the uh, the episodes that actually air. So go on and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Turn on that little notifications button so when those launch, you are the first to know. So let's dive in. We're going to go, oh, almost forgot, staff at tasteofcountry.com is where you can leave your thoughts, your comments, and that's also where the trivia question can be left um, as well on our YouTube comments. So we always appreciate that, and one of your comments could end up on one of our podcast episodes. So without further ado, Mr. Billy Dukes is here, and we're going to talk Yellowstone. Hey, Billy. Hello, Addison. Always my favorite thing, and I hope everyone else enjoys uh, your your gusty intros as well. I try, I try to be hail, hail fellow well met. My mom and dad always taught me that was a good quality to have. So it is, yeah. Well, let's kick things off with your favorite portion, and my favorite portion too, because my favorite is getting to hear the like the winners' affirmation. Yeah. But what was last week's trivia question, and who won? Staff at tasteofcountry.com is always the place to answer trivia. But last week I asked a pretty simple, a uh, pretty easy trivia question in terms of it was easy to find out online if you didn't automatically know the answer. And it was this. Uh, we'll, so, we'll soon learn about Casey Dutton's military record. He's a former Navy SEAL. And this is the second time that actor Luke Grimes has played a Navy SEAL. What was the first time? And the correct answer was the movie American Sniper, which I think was 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. Um, mm-hmm. And congratulations to Hayden, who knew the right answer. She hit us up on Hayden. email. YouTube is also a great place to answer those questions as well. And we just take the first answer every time. So Hayden, congratulations. She's a longtime listener. So I've exchanged emails with her for a long Aww. time. She may have even answered a trivia question correctly before. But Hayden, you know the drill. This is your day, Hayden. We're all celebrating Hayden today. Put your Go Hayden Go posters up above your garage. It is Hayden's Day, a parade down Main Street for Hayden, who is doing all the things right on this day today. 
Queen Hayden. Have yourselves a damn day. Get it, girl. Billy and the Whistling. This is so much more fun so- now that people can actually see. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's not just me absorbing. Yeah. What is this week's trivia question? Well, it goes back to a conversation we had during last week's episode. We were talking about the one man on the reservation who had the voice, like the funny voice, the voice that didn't seem to match the body. If you recall, um, we spent a little bit of time commenting about that. Uh, that actor's name is, apologize if I mispronounce this, Takala Black Elk. And his character on Yellowstone is Sam Stands Alone. He was the man with the voice that didn't seem to match the body. And we've actually seen this actor before and talked about him before on this very podcast in previous seasons. Where and why do we see actor Takala Black Elk in a Yellowstone franchise episode? You and I have talked about him? In depth. We spent quite a bit of time on this particular scene. It's a very important scene um, as it relates to the franchise. I'm going to have to sleep on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't have time. I mean, you're, if you sleep on it, you're going to lose, Addison. It is not going to be your day. <laughs> It'll be someone else's. But Dang if you can tell me yeah, um, you're so what right. show he was on oh. and particularly just kind of describe the scene and the characters he was with, I'll give you credit for it. Staff at country.com or in the uh, YouTube comment section. All righty. Let us, let's start with episode two. Kind of give us a general synopsis of what happened, and then we can kind of talk about what individually stood out for us. Episode two for me was a cleanup episode. Like the whole episode was spent sort of cleaning up the mess made of the episode one, where Lee is killed, um, he actually, but in that case, he comes in and shoots Robert Long. They got to cover up that murder, which in effect is what it was, even though it was in self defense in a lot of ways. That would have been really tough to explain. Uh, the paramedics or the medical examiner has discovered that Lee wouldn't have been able to shoot Robert because the bullet that he took would have paralyzed him. So they figure out there must have been a third shooter and want to know who was that third shooter. Obviously, it was Casey, so this is a big issue. Uh, John puts Jamie in charge of sort of the clo- the cover-up, and Jamie does a pretty good job of hopping into action and putting things into motion, and he kind of skirts that line of legality. Actually, he really crosses it, but he makes the attorney general think he's skirting that line. Uh, they have to figure out what to do uh, with a couple of things. One is what to do with Lee's body, because Lee's body, someone could re-examine that and come to the same findings as the medical examiner. So they dig up Lee's body, and I don't know, what, are they, what is that thing they put him in? What it, how would you describe tactfully what they do with Lee's body? <laughs> well, essentially what I, it's, it's a cremation, but for a horse is what I took that as. I think the furnace, is that what you would call that thing? Yeah, one big pizza oven. Yes, a furnace. <laughs> kind of what it is. Like, uh, like it's meant for horses, but they put Lee's body in there to cremate it. And the and the whole thing about it is, and the, the I don't even know the like actual technical term of it's not medical examiner. I don't know what you would say of who. I, what was the terminology for, or like, the, you see what I'm saying? Like the profession of the man who was doing what he was doing. Um, you know, it takes a significant amount of heat yeah. to decompose a horse. Well, you put a human in there and it's going to take half the time. I mean, or not even half the time. Literally the guy says like, this should be done in what, like 10 minutes? Yeah. I, I don't know the exact timing, but essentially we're like express heating this bad boy. It gets the job done. And obviously they can't go yes. through like a normal... Like, is that a mortician, maybe? Like, like a mortician would do that normally, maybe? Cremator. Would do the we'll just call him a cremator. Yeah, cremator. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, they can't go to a normal person because that would kind of trigger some red flags. So they have to kind of go to someone who's friendly to the Duttons. Um, and then along the way, John has to convince or even bribe people to change their story. And the first person he talks to is... Um, a friend who is the father of one of the guys saying that they saw uh, someone coming up on a horse. And that guy essentially just says, tell me what to say by tomorrow morning. That's all that he's going to say. Done and done. 
The other person is a priest, and he essentially blackmails a priest. <laughs> yeah, did we ever... Well, I don't know if I should have asked the question now, but did we ever... What was John blackmailing him for? He just said, like, you owe me a favor. That's all we know, is that a favor was okay. owed. John comes knocking for that favor. The priest delivers a sermon that is very specific to one member of his flock's situation, and it totally works, which is amazing. The guy even says, like, I feel like that was said just to me. and like Convicted, yeah. That was that. Like, all things good. Like, don't have to worry about it. And that works. So check and check there. The body is the third thing, and then the medical examiner is the fourth thing. And that's when Rip shows up in black gloves. And whenever Rip shows up in black gloves, you're in trouble. Uh, he kind of convinces the guy to go along with this murder scheme and makes it look like a suicide. And that even ends up working. Like, I was, I was stunned there as well. Like, the second, the first time it was a really believable sequence. The second time through, it's like, wow, this, this guy was really cool with just today's my time to die. Right, where he's like, all right, mm -hmm. where the Rip pretty much says, like, you know you wanted to die anyways. And the guy's like, has this epiphany of like, hmm, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Bada bing, bada boom. Just let me smoke you know, one gets... more of these embalming fluid soaked cigarettes and I'll be good to go. Thanks, boss. And that's what he does. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like, yeah. In, in the Dutton family world, they the first time you try to take care of something, somehow it goes, it goes as planned the, so far. So all of this works, but there was a, like one thing, and this is one scene I can't get out of my mind is the look that John gives Jamie as Lee's body first goes into the furnace. He gives him this long sort of you messed this up kind of stare. And Jamie really didn't. Like Jamie handled this about as well as you possibly can. I don't know why John was so angry with Jamie in this sequence. So I actually took that a little differently. I took that as we are in deeper than we realize kind of like a commonality of we're sharing a glance that we know we are in over our head because you're right jamie didn't do I, I mean jamie's doing the best that he can and the fact that i am remotely on jamie's side is you know might want to check my pulse so uh, yeah G i didn't take that as much of as John looking at Jamie of like, you've really screwed this up. It was more so this like understanding of let's hope this works. This is behind us. This is really like, this is we're in deep. Could it be that both things are true that John meant it that way, but Jamie interpreted it as his father, not approving of the job he's done because where Jamie's going oh, totally. next, these next few episodes like all of his insecurities are starting to fly. He even tells Beth, like his dad never looked at him like he looked at Lee. And then there's some totally. things that are going to happen in, later in season one that really kind of Jamie just finds Jamie sort of unraveling. Yeah. And I could see it like you just said. I wouldn't do it the other way around of John being like, you really mess this up. I, I definitely think it could be john looking at him as if we're in deep and then jamie receiving that as well great my dad thinks i messed up like he's yeah. ticked uh while we're on the cremation part just because i wanted to be knowledgeable i did google uh who cremates horses with over 28 years of experience this is from midwest cremation services uh with over 28 years of experience performing equine cremation it's called oh wait <laughs> I might have just made myself an idiot. Uh, you um, just plugged a company there. There, what are you, are you getting like a little <laughs> a side paycheck here from that from that company? You're like, oh, I thought I had something, I, but in the end, all I did is just I give know. this company some extra business. <laughs> I did. Okay. I thought it was going to give me the name of um the like who performs it. Right. Like, what's the just, profession? Yeah. What's the profession? That's what I originally looked up, but. Never mind. We're just gonna we're just gonna move on. I would think it's like an animal mortician. Yeah, it's actually just not it's not giving me anything. So hmm. it just asks me who actually cremates their horses. The other So we're gonna move on. The other <laughs> part about episode two that um 
we really kind of zoom in on is Rip and Beth's romance begins to kind of take some sort of shape. Like before they were kind of just on and off again, on again, off again partners. But now they go on this date where Beth um, chases wolves. And that's a thing. Casual. She does. That's what I do, Billy. <laughs> uh, on my on my first dates, I go, let's go chase some wolves. Uh, but she has a couple of lines in this episode that I think maybe really remember. Like the one line is, it's only the things I love that die, Rip. Never me. And like we yeah. start to see that immediately with episode three that we'll get to here in a second. But then I kind of wonder if maybe that's even some foreshadowing about how this whole series is going to wrap up. Like, she's so loyal to her dad. And we don't know this yet, so it's not a spoiler. Like, these events haven't played out. Like, maybe, like, John Dutton and Rip, ultimately, in the season series finale, maybe they die as well. I could, unfortunately, see that. Yeah. There has been a few moments like that throughout this rewatching of of season one where I've been like, oh, maybe that applies. Now, I want to believe that's true, but like also like the way seasons like four and five start to become written, it, it feels like in some ways Taylor Sheridan's trying to build the plane as he's falling from the sky. Um, so maybe I'm just being a little optimistic, but I don't know. It seems like there's some connections there. I think what was interesting for me, and I didn't know this until this episode, is realizing that Casey... Beth and John talk about the fact, you know, John lets Beth in on the situation and Beth says, you know, well, we got to do what we need to do. uh, Casey was mom's favorite. And so we pledged to protect him. And I just think that I just didn't know that Casey was his mom's favorite. And it, I mean, we'll talk about this, I guess, in episode three. And as the season so far has continued, it is like, I didn't realize how much of the favorite Casey, like all Four, three kids now, or I guess, sorry, two, Jamie and Beth, are here to protect Casey all as a, like, commitment to their mother. Beth, the the mother, she seems to be a real piece of work, like, in in terms of her her mothering techniques. Not stand, like, this isn't, like, standard parenting. Like, (laughs) she would not win a Mother of the Year award. Like, she is... Cruel, and I don't want to get into episode three quite yet because I want to do something else. I know. Real, but we'll get there. But she does seem to have some cruel tactics, not only in this episode, but in some later episodes with Beth that are coming up. But hmm. um, staff at tasteofcountry.com if, if you have some response to that. But I have a new segment I'd like to introduce. Ooh, yes, please. It's called Don't Worry About It. <laughs> Love it. I know where we're headed. <laughs> There are some things that happened in episode two and then they're going to happen in episode three and and through on that seem important. But I'm here to tell you that you don't have to waste a lot of energy worrying about it. So we're just going to kind of gloss over some things that happened in episode two that seemed exciting to a first time watcher. But without spoiling it, I, I'm just going to say, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, example. Mm-hmm. Tate's dinosaur. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not coming back. All right. I can't say that I lost sleep. Oh, you want to know what Billy could be a don't worry about it? Longtime listeners will absolutely relate to the statement. You know what we don't need to worry about, Billy? Hmm. Lug nut boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about That's it. That's season three, but <laughs> you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just had to add it in. Yeah. What else for uh, episode two? Uh, Casey's phone call to his former military commander, who I believe is a Navy SEAL captain. Don't worry about it. <laughs> cool. Cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. These are, these are small spoilers. I, I, I do understand. But they're also just saving you a little bit of a time. And then the last one I have is, and at the time I thought this was going to be a big, big problem. Casey exchanges gun slides with that, like, um, police chief with the reservation police uh-huh. chief. Like, I think that's going to be a huge thing. Like, he goes on to help kill that uh, meth guy, but then he also shoots a few guys in episode three. And that seems like it's going to be an issue, but don't worry about it. <laughs> that one you get, that one's less of a like, don't worry about it, but like, you will get an answer for. 
kind of, but we never goes back around to like the slides actually being an issue. Oh, like they never track that gun or trace that gun again. Um, but now on the flip side of this, there is one thing that you really should kind of lean into every time you see it happen. And we see it happen, I think three times now, anytime Casey is around a wolf. Yep. Like pay attention to that. And it happens with episode two with the wolf on the highway. Um, in episode three, he's guarding his mom. And then I think even episode four, there's even a wolf scene, which we'll talk about next week. But like there is something that comes of Casey and the wolf and it's going to be a few seasons. Do worry about that. Like that's meaningful. That yeah. that is worth sort of paying attention to and just just file a little bit back of your mind for now. I think about all these wolf sequences. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Well, on that note, moving into episode three, which was titled No Good Horses, this was one that like you you have the opening scene and I'll let you kind of take it from here. But where we find where we actually even see Beth's mother, I don't feel like she has any cameo before now. Like we see, you know, mm-hmm. photo, like we know that she exists, but she's no longer in the picture. Episode three is where we find kind of what what went wrong. Like, why did she die? Billy, that was a hard that was a hard scene for me to watch. Hard, but at the same time, I will say the mom already kind of annoyed me on how she treated Beth and all the above. So that sounds really brutal. I can't say I didn't shed a tear like I shed when Elsa died. I am kind of curious to get your take on that. As like a a daughter, like watching that exchange between Beth and her mother is probably a different experience than me who you know, a totally different perspective on the account that I'm a son, not a daughter. Like what was your right. sort of experience watching how Evelyn Dutton is her name? She belittles her daughter in a lot of ways and, and makes her feel like she's just not strong enough or brave enough. And her, her level of tough love is like beyond anything I've certainly experienced or witnessed. Oh, well, and realizing like my mom did a really, really good job. I mean, she still does a good job as I'm an adult, but when I was growing up of kind of the sky was the limit and like was so affirming to like my dreams or what I wanted to do that like literally, I mean, even the career I'm pursuing was all thanks to my mom just really encouraging me to like do it. And um, I think that that is absolutely, you know, nurtured, you know, when you go nature versus nurture, I absolutely think that's nurtured. Um, And so when I was watching that with Beth and, you know, I've seen, you know, episode uh, season four and then the A of season five. And I think when I saw that, I understood. I'm like, I I get why Beth I I'm not I'm not dis I'm not okaying Beth's, you know, how she lives her life. Uh, you know, there's cold refinement and we could have worked through that. But uh, you know, now understanding how Beth's mom treated her, I'm like, in her formative years. You know, we just see that kind of one clip, yeah. but obviously Beth is, you know, what a, a, let's say elementary age that, you know, that's been going on before then. And so that's something that's drilled into you since you were little that, you know, I, now that I see Beth, I'm like, hmm, I kind of understand why you're the way that you are. Totally. Yep. Um, so to re- kind of reset the scene, it's a flashback sequence. And this is the first one of these. We get a lot of them throughout Yellowstone early seasons, and they're really wonderful. Um, but there it's, uh, Beth and Casey and her mom kind of on a horse. And, and there's some sort of situation where Beth tries to open the gate and she's struggling with her horse and her mom is already telling her she's too afraid of the horse and the horse is picking up on it. 
Uh, Beth walks through the gate. What happens after that is never really clear to me, like how Beth, how Evelyn actually dies. Like, it seems like the horse falls on Evelyn and maybe that leads to her death. But like what the actual cause of death is, I don't think is ever really stated. It's just a bunch of events that led to it. Uh, Beth goes to get her dad and they never they, they don't find Evelyn and she's being guarded by Casey at the time until dark. My dad, it's it's far too late um, and Evelyn dies there. But um, it's a sad scene, but a, a lot of questions left sort of unanswered. But it certainly does sort of lead us to uh, the Beth Dutton we know today. Well, and essentially, so kind of like filling in some some gaps here is when the mom's dying she pretty much, you know, Beth is looking over her and she tells Beth, essentially, this is all your fault, which, oh my gosh, yeah. talk about, you know, the last few moments of your mom being on earth and telling you, you know, her death is your fault. Yep. You can't, and no therapy can fully, like, that person can never come back and rewrite what they said. And so, and I think to your point, us never fully understand how she died. I was a little confused. I'm like, I don't really understand how this is Beth's fault, other than how I took that as like, it probably wasn't Beth's fault, but the mom is just so like un no, I mean, I literally can't even unfathomably angry towards her daughter that she, you know, anything that goes wrong is going to be Beth's fault. Um yeah, but then also I don't know if you felt this way, but I didn't realize that Casey stayed until his mom died, essentially. And you know, interesting and I don't necessarily have an answer for this unless you do of like, did that carry on at all as he got older of like PTSD or anything like that? Like Casey's kind of seems unscathed emotionally about it. And I would be very scarred. Well, Casey has some PTSD for other reasons that we learn about, but Correct. There, it doesn't ever seem to be anything based on Mom that. Like he seems to be pretty uh, as well off as you can be meant emotionally after that yeah. experience. Um, and doesn't even really, a lot of the issues he has with his dad don't seem to, uh, come from Stem that, from the mom. um, the, other things that happened, but he he does seem to be pretty strong, a good protector of it, which is interesting. This was definitely, and I'll, we can just kind of take it from here of what else happened, but this was a, it was a heavy episode. We yeah. kick it off with that. And then next we see Casey and Tate driving along the road. He sees a van on the reservation, right? It was yep. on the reservation. That's right. And what was he saying? Like laws don't exist on the reservation and people can get away with stuff that they shouldn't, right? That was the idea. Yeah. Like people might, it's almost like um, a, a safe haven for like people who are, don't live on the reservation. They can come commit some crimes because they can get away with it because there's no cooperation between the reservation police and normal state police. Um, that's what he was getting at. And they, they, the people he comes upon are, as we find out, would be rapists of a girl who lives on the reservation. They don't get along with it, but Casey kind of interrupts the whole thing and kills the men and they have to bury it. And this whole exchange is almost a don't worry about it, save that it does kind of show how Casey, he never flat out murders some people for like malicious reasons. Like almost everybody Casey kills is a justified killing. And that's yeah. kind of true throughout the series. There's probably some examples where that's not necessarily the case, but those two men, it was a justified killing and you're going to find out that he ends up kind of being okay with it. But, um, and that goes through the sequence and I don't know after this episode, I think that whole thing is kind of put to bed. For the most part. That's why I say it's an almost don't worry about it. Yeah, we won't get into spoilers, but I do think it just you'll want to be aware of it enough for yeah. episode four. Wait. Yeah, episode four is next. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait, I think that's when it all happens. Uh, the, the part that does, I think. Well, the, the, Thomas goes to jail for a little bit and. um there is a sequence where John tells him, if you want to steal the cattle, now you get the bull. I thought that was an eye rolling line there from John Dutton, but he gives the cattle back and John ultimate or Thomas ultimately gets out of jail. So he ends up being a free man. The other part of this episode that I think is really important is this whole play about who's going to get into politics as the, uh, as the district attorney for the state of Montana. Like Jamie really wants that job and wants to run, 
but John wants to give it to Beth, which is a really, really big curveball and it offends Jamie. Um, they end up having this huge fight out in the barn and that gets really ugly. And Jamie hits her after a lot of goading. How did that saying make you feel like Beth really, really, really goads him. And then Jamie, he does, he hits her, which is awful, but I don't know. I, I didn't, I felt a little bit bad for Jamie and I don't know if, if I should have, like, I, I didn't know how to feel there. I did. So, okay, I have two younger siblings and my brothers have never, I mean, you know, they were taught that at a very young age, if you do not hit uh, a female and, but I will say like, because I grew up with two brothers, I had to hold my own and none of, neither, none of the Hager kiddos ever like swung at each other. Like that's how we started it. Yeah. Actually, I, I don't think we, like if, if we ever hit each other, it was like, a push or a slap. Like I, I've never been fisted to, right. with my brothers and vice versa. But I mean, definitely we've had like clashes before where we just are like rough housing and it gets, so I, I could, I, I also kind of felt bad for Jamie of Beth Dutton was absolutely provoking. Yeah. I literally was like, girl, you want him to fight you. You want him to like physically react when she said, I literally wrote the quote a man would have walked away. I'm like, if I entered that with my brothers, I know I am absolutely asking. I want them to rebuttal. Like that is the only reason why you say a statement like that is because you're wanting, you're not trying to lull, you know, and mull things over. You are wanting a reaction. So for that, I say Beth, wa Beth opened that opportunity. And then she went and tattled on him and told John Dutton too. So like the whole thing, like, her behavior was really poor. Like, obviously, he shouldn't have hit her. Correct. But it, it Correct. was like a, I don't know, it was a really complicated scene to emotionally sort of navigate. I just don't understand. Well, well, I guess I, I don't understand this, but I think Beth 100% gets a rise out of conflict. Whether it's with her dad, whether it's with to. Rip, like yeah. her relationship with Rip could be normal and like not suited. I mean, not settled around conflict. Like, I think that's the only reason why the relationship is working is because there's always they're always at odds, and half the time she is literally asking for it. Rip doesn't necessarily. Rip is more of like an even kill human. Yeah. Don't mess with Rip, but he's a generally an even kill human where half the fights i'm like girly girly pop like we <laughs> yeah beth is not someone who i'd actually call girly pop to her face but like it wasn't needed she's provoking it was not needed she, she's yeah. provoking it and jamie's totally right that she's she's sort of a cancer to the family and it's this interplay between beth and jamie that i think really i don't think i realized the first time i watched it how important that was to sort of the thread of the show um, it becomes yeah. sort of the main plot line in season five, and it's a subplot right now, but it's kind of not the subplot. It's, it is sort of the dominant plot. You just don't notice it in these early seasons um, because it's not always right there in, in front of you. But it, it, it leads to very much where Jamie's headed and some of John's decisions. And then there's a the whole Beth and Rip thing like you can make a case that Beth's the main character. I think what was interesting, and was it was it Thomas Rainwater or Dan Jenkins who said this is kind of the episode that we learn uh, about the inheritance tax? He's going to tax. And actually, Rainwater I'm, says that. Uh, is it Rainwater yeah. who essentially is like, I'm going to the inheritance tax is going to be so insane that yeah. your family couldn't afford it? Like, come hell or high water, I will find a way to not let your family own the ranch and i think that kind of sets up the fundamentals like we already see episode one that there is clash between um like the reservation and the dutton ranch and i think though that statement in this episode really lays the groundwork for truly what the i mean what john is fighting for all seasons so before we get to fan q a a couple things to look forward to with episode four is we um uh, we are introduced to the train station and we get a full explanation 
about what that's going to be. And that is super exciting. Episode four is a really, really good episode. It was hard for me not to talk about episode four in this podcast because it is sort of a same. It's a seminal episode. Like there's things that happen. Like it's a big Lloyd episode and Lloyd's really good. Uh, The train station. Like I'm really excited to talk about that next week. But um, I'll hold back and we can get to Q&A. 